the stuff we've seen today or in the class. Hooray, genome sequencing was a big deal back in the day. We had no idea what the genome looked like for humans. So everybody gets all like high and mighty with their little quotes and such when they sequenced it, very exciting. But the genome itself is sort of a weird like piece of art. There's repeats, it's unique, but it's not. And the cool thing is with the philosophical look at DNA and life is that if information is life, then information is sort of immortal if it's a good gene, right? It'll keep going, it'll keep making itself. But one fun part that I, we never really knew about was that the genome tells a big history, things that used to matter in humans, but that we lost, but they're still kind of fossilized in the DNA. Genes that we never knew we had, but don't really activate in us anymore. But the biggest thing was that when you sequence something, you start to see what its genes look like at the protein level and how you can sort of act against them. So on the left, you see E. coli. We know the pieces that make an E. coli bacteria. That's one of its little plasmids. We also know what can happen over here. This is the Ebola virus. Each of these little proteins right here is a gene in the Ebola genome. Each one of these we can at least sort of somewhat act on in medicine. So once you have that code, you can start looking at, like we've talked about, the things that matter, the proteins. That's what you drug, that's what you kill. Okay, you'll see and you'll notice if you've gone in the practice questions, I'm not gonna hammer you on how each of these sequencings work. If you want to know more and if you eventually get into something, you'll take Dr. Leon's class or you'll eventually just run into something like this. But Sanger sequencing, categorize this as a very efficient, cheap, nice way to sequence accurately just a small 500 base pair piece. So in your notes, this is something that you would use to just identify if one piece is missing, for example, one mutation maybe. I'll show you a little bit how it works. So what you end up with is you get a piece of DNA that you want to sequence. Now, this piece of DNA could be like how we did the DNA digest, where it's your whole genome and you can just like toss them in. What you'll have ultimately is a primer. Five to three prime, hooray. You do have to set this up with a primer to start, but then it'll just basically sequence about 500 nucleotides for you. Nice and accurate, pretty, pretty good. Now how this works is that the ingredients to Sanger are just a bunch of nucleotides, so nice normal ones running around, but then you also have these little ones that are basically fluorophored. What that means is they have like a color to them, like a color signal. The color signal ones do not have an OH at their three prime. So how, this, how Sanger ends up working is that we can measure the colors and each little nucleotide is colored similarly, like in here. Thymines are red, guanines are yellow, down the line. What they also do is that when they bind at a certain point, they stop the sequence. Because with, without any three prime to add to, DNA polymerase just halts. So what you end up with is sort of a stacked sequence like this. See this? G, A, C, T, G, A, A, right? What you do is you are basically making sort of this like block set of DNA. Now it's random when one of the colored ones shows up and sticks to that DNA, but there's a lot of DNA out there. You'll end up with like hundreds of each of these little strands usually to the point that you'll be able to measure them. So how we measure them, and yeah, you need a primer to start this, so I'll, I'll kind of note that again later. So, seems complicated, but it's the gels again. Bigger segments and gels of DNA, they're slower, right? They're at the top. Smaller ones are on the bottom. And so you can start to read the sequence because if you start small and then you go up and each one is gonna have that unique color to it, you can start to see the color signals start to be very like nice and segmented, very clean. So 
In my more evil days, I would have you interpret a Sanger graph like this, for example. Here, let me get lengthwise. But it's one of those things that knowing the principle and like going through it in class, it helps you understand why it's clean, why you don't see the same level of mistakes, and why this is cheap too. So after seeing this today, hopefully it makes a, little, makes a little sense how we can actually use this and why some of the gel stuff actually still matters quite a bit. So this, this piece right here is probably the most helpful as far as understanding this process. So just like you did in lab, you can basically follow the sequence here. And that's what's happening on this side right here. So see how it's going to match piece by piece. And these smaller segments are at the beginning, right? Because you just made a smaller segment there. Sweet. Okay. So it's very cool. It's, it's possible I, you know, listen to the wrong song and feel a little evil and put something like this in the exam. That's okay. You guys will be fine. Main thing I need you to know, and this is in the practice questions where it's like, here's your research question. Here's what you want to do. You want to sequence just this one spot right here. Does it make sense to sequence the entire genome multiple times in multiple people? Probably not. This is a way better shot here. So if you need a certain small region, Sanger is your purse, is your thing. So for a long time, that's really all we had. It was just this little 500 base pairs at a time. Human genomes 4.7 billion nucleotides long. <laughs> If you wanted to do the math in your calculator, how far along you'd need to do that, even if you were doing 100 of those tests a day, you can see how this would be a bit of an issue. Because Sanger's actually been around long before the genome was actually sequenced. So how did we figure stuff out before in the old days? Had to use pedigrees and had to use linkage. So we've seen this example before. Oops, there it is. Okay. So sad story starts with a disease that we've seen before. So Nancy Wexler was a kind of a early age computer scientist of all things. But one day she and her sister get a call from the LAPD saying, your mother was drunk. We found her on the sidewalk, like running around, come get her. Now she's in the holding cell and they, she's still just like fidgeting around and like really out of control. Like can't really like very, Neuro, neurological issues. She's not actually drunk. Unfortunately, what she has is Huntington's. So we've seen this before, right? Dominant gene repeats the whole thing. Now, remember, we can't sequence anybody. We don't even know what gene this is on. We have no idea what chromosome this is on. We only have small little pieces that exist. So long time, this was still fairly rare. We knew it ran in families, but we didn't really have a good diagnosis for it or why it would, or what would activate it, anything like that. We had no cause. But at this point, all that Nancy and her sister knew is that they had a 50-50 shot at having that pass to them. So her goal in life became to figure out where this gene was and how to sequence it. Because remember, you gotta find that one piece to be able to send the primer in and sequence it and say, do you have the good version or do you have the bad version? We still have no idea how to find that. So remember SNPs? Little small, inconsistent little mutations that we all have that kind of make us different, right? Little variations that don't change anything evolution-wise. Indels are just the same thing. They're just a deletion. So our early genome was very much just guided by where certain SNPs were. That was it. Because remember, we only know like certain outposts in this ocean at this point. It looks like a lot of outposts. That's a lot of text. This is a very, this is the first application of what SNPs were used for. We knew that there were regions that were variable across people and would pass down. And the way that we could figure out where a gene was, was see what SNP that gene was linked to physically, right? Yeah, full circle, right? It wasn't just the flies. The only way to find genes was to say like, okay, it's linked right here with these SNPs, for example. It keeps showing up with those ones in families. Now, humans aren't flies, though. 
limited offspring, right? Huntington's is already rare, kind of a tough deal. So Wex, Dr. Wexler's search needed something like this, a massive amount of Huntington's patients. And this is tough, obviously, because it kills you around 30 to 40, maybe 50. You needed something like this. So in her searches, remember, this is before the internet. This took years. She had heard stories of a village in Venezuela, of all places, with a sort of bottleneck effect, that people in this village were afflicted by something, something similar to what her mom had. What the villagers called it was El Mal. To this day, there exists this village in Venezuela. For whatever reason, Huntington's is a dominant gene. And when populations don't move too much, genes stay. Genes get bigger. You'll see that in some of these cases, in some of the saddest part of the story, she, as she was building this pedigree and sequencing SNPs that she knew so she could see where it was tracking with, can you imagine somebody who has two copies of the Huntington's, right? That's when you die when you're like 12. So this was tough. This was tough work to see in and out. And to this day, this, this region is still afflicted pretty heavily by this gene. So what she was able to find was that SNPs on chromosome four always came with the Huntington's trait. Once she had that info, and once you knew the location, all you gotta do is make a primer right next to the gene and start sequencing. Let me get a whiteboard out here. Mm, no. So once you had a primer in an area, you're like, okay, here's the region. Do Sanger for 500, right? Genes are bigger than 500, right? Well, luckily you sequence this part, make a primer out of this part, stack it on top, go another 500. Make a primer out of this new stuff you found over and over and over again. And that's how you can sequence the whole gene. So what they found was the repeats that we now know. They found that people that were dying from the disease had like way more than 36 repeats, tons, sometimes in the hundreds. They were the ones that had the more severe cases. Huntington's is broad expressivity because it depends on how many of those repeats you have. So once you had this info, and we just do a quick like fun formative poll here. After all these years of hunting for this, knowing your mom had it, and at this point she had died, do you sequence yourself to know if you have the Huntington's disease? Would you want to know? Yeah. I probably would too. I don't know. I'd, I'd be freaked out by it. All right. Last bit of the story. Did she have it or not? Yeah. Sad end, but think about all the impact she made. Now you can sequence it, now you can prepare, now you can also do genetic counseling for people with this and say, all right, you run this risk now of passing this on. You have to be prepared for that. So at the least, we are a little bit ahead of things. Hooray. All right. So on that grim note, funny, I don't really care about Dogecoin, but I did have a Shiba growing up. So I like all the stuff that comes out from it. All right. So enjoy yourself.
Okay, so that's how Sanger can work, but that's no way to do a whole genome, right? But piece by piece, you can't find genes. It is arduous work. So finding the real thing, the big one. Now, I bet you've probably seen some of the uh, some of the news sites and stuff be like, oh, we found the genome or something. Um, we've had it the whole time. It's just about getting a nice uniform picture and basically finding all the regions that are a little more distant in that case. There we go. Okay. So the story goes, Francis Collins from the NIH in America, he is public. He was using Sanger piece by piece, 500 by 500 to go along the whole thing. And as you can imagine, that's, uh, that's tough. It was slow, but it was, it was slow, but it was honest work, right? This is Craig Venter, private. He came up with another way to sequence. Now the story is more complicated than I can give you today, but man, these two hated each other. But they did end up working together for the reason to kind of accelerate what we call today HG1, Human Genome 1. And anytime informatics enters a field, it sort of exponentially explodes. It's what you see with computer science. It's what you're starting to see in biology in a lot of ways. Venter brought his tech, something called shotgun sequencing, to the fold. So instead of doing these like small miniature Sangers that I'm doing up here, what he did was have a big sonication, like a fracturing step. And he would do this. And remember, you got lots of these DNA molecules running around. So you're making like millions of copies of these areas, right? So what he does is he violently fracture these. And Venter's key was that he had people on his team that could harness computers to stitch these pieces together. So he'd only go like, you know, he'd go like, he'd go maybe like a million at a time. But what you could find is that these regions could overlap in certain small spots. And if there was enough certainty to overlap, the computer would say, all right, stitch these two together, keep going. And what you could do with all this data was sort of what you have down here. Piece by piece, you could integrate a giant assembled sequence from small miniature sequences. So, Venter shows up to this and the story actually goes, they were actually in an airport after a conference kind of talking shit to one another. And Venter says, all right, I'll let you use the shotgun sequencing because you're slow, old man. But the offer he made was undoable. He said, I want to own the top 100 genes in terms of medicine, and that can change any year. It's a strange thought to have, right? That that was a negotiation at one point, that you could commercialize a genome. And it almost was, and this is the phrase that was used, is that the genome started to become sort of like the moon landings, but you could take pieces. So for example, even Tony Blair in the UK was like, well, we've sequenced chromosome 11, 12, and 13. Those are, those are ours. That's our data. Venter had sequenced some of the early chromosomes. Meanwhile, the smaller chromosomes had been done by Sanger on the left, by Francis Collins. So it was starting to get a little, things were getting a little messy. Does anybody actually own the information on the genome? This was surprising enough, this was actually negotiated. But we settled on co-publishing and everybody kind of went home decently happy. Now here's what we found, because there were pieces of this sequencing and let's say, you know, the whole thing's done now, but we found pieces that we were surprised by. So on the top, you'll see, and the reason this is in blue text is I don't need you to know the percents. It would be red text for the composition, the general composition. So what the genome actually is on top, actual genes, not too many, right? Tiny amount in red. Regions that actually that DNA becomes RNA, becomes protein. One and a half percent. That's it. For a long time, we figured, we called everything here junk DNA. There's another familiar character in here that was a surprising amount, but those are introns. Those little like, like stuffers basically in between the genes.
Now, what we know now is that there's very little useless DNA out there. So all this stuff, when they first did it, they were really kind of stunned at, okay, what does it do if it's not a gene? What's one region of DNA that can have an effect without coding for anything? Think epigenetics. You don't have to shout it out. I just do want you to think, though. Lots and lots of enhancers. Lots of regions that control genes. Because at this stage, remember, we had no idea what epigenetics was. We were still in the mindset that, like a fly, there's a curly wing gene. So for us, there must be an Alzheimer's gene. There must be a height gene. There must be, you know, a smart gene, right? So at this point, we didn't really have that, that power. So we were a little surprised by this. Now, the region, and we should also, I should also note that Sanger sequencing helped us with a lot of the genome areas that shotgun couldn't. Shotgun sequencing, for example, think how hard it would be with all these repeated areas if that whole segment was just a bunch of A's, right? Just like a bunch. The computer program wouldn't know what to do, right? Long repeated sequences, you need to use Sanger on those. You can't use big... Big sequencing. So, other point here, of these hundred, of these one and a half percent of the area, what did they actually do? A lot of these are pretty familiar, right? Enzymes. You guys did that in one hundred and five, right? Hooray! Membrane things, immune proteins, some skeletal stuff. Transcription factors are big ones too. But to this day, there's plenty of stuff that when we found and sequenced it and we're like, it does become RNA and it's got all the structure or it's just, but it's just silenced or we have no idea what it does. So one way that you can actually figure this out and do consider this red text. This is like some of the practice questions I gave you, right? I think, I think if you've scrolled far enough, this is the question where it's like, what kind of gene is this? This is the beginning of that. We know what transcription factors do. Some of the clues would be like it binds to DNA, stuff like that, right? Any membrane protein, that has to have a region that goes through the hydrophobic plasma membrane, right? Because that's how they were doing this. They were finding strings of amino acids that were hydrophobic all in a row and saying like, all right, that actually makes sense that this is gonna be a membrane one. Anything that was a ligand, for example. So remember, ligands are the little things that will bind to receptors, right? They would know that that had to be all hydrophilic because they're out in the open all over the place. So we still have a week on those questions, and we'll have some more detail and fun to go through them. But this is sort of that intro to that style question, which is, if I give you some info on a gene, and it's also a test of your protein knowledge too, can you tell me what kind of gene it is if it's one of these unknown ones? And obviously enzymes easy, I'll say it has an active site. It's almost too easy to use, but that's exactly what he'd say if it was on the test. Okay, so, Next little fun sci-fi piece, and this is a piece of technology that is not, it's trade secreted and it's not open source, so it can't be, it can't be vetted the way a normal scientific paper is, but we did find genes that had meaning and that we can stitch those together using information to piece you together. It started to come to fruition. You can use the genome and the, even the SNPs not just coding genes, to determine, let's say in this case, skin, eye, hair, color, and freckles, let's say, right? Computer can feed that in. You can give it the ancestry SNPs and say, all right, where's your geographic ancestry? And it can be pretty good sometimes. Now, this is, this is one of the good examples on the company website. You can imagine that sometimes it doesn't do well, okay? Because like with stats, as far as like what the fit is, if these dots are individuals, but the trend is that way, 
can always be a little different, right? Stats apply to populations, not individuals. So data like these, yeah, it's possible, but you have to take it with that grain of salt. So that you can put together different genetic differences and predict how somebody might look. Is uh, strangely enough, as far as genomics and law go, this is a way that if you grab an unknown DNA sample and toss it into this, it will try and give you something. It can't be used in court because it's not peer reviewed. It's private. It's a trade secret how they do it. So can't use it usually. Can only it can't be used in court. Okay. Other big deal with the genome, we started to see that we had a lot in common with translatable models like mice. We've got plenty of genes that are pretty much the same as mice and as in us. It does not mean that they interact the same, but it showed us that they can be suitable models for anything that we're testing. At the least, let's say I want to kill off this cancer-causing gene, CDK9, right? May as well test that drug in a mouse first, right? That translatability was key. This started to allow kind of an explosion of kind of medical advance where it's like, all right, we can match this gene. We can, we can go forward with this. It was also a little unnerving how much we had in common with most, most other mammals. I think people weren't really ready for that. A lot of people still really aren't. But I spied this on the genome composition. What are we mostly made of? What do we mostly share our genome with? Nasty little transposons. So if we go back up there, I think it was something over like a third of your genome is just leftover jumping genes. Just bouncing around all over the place. Once in a while, they'll get silenced through methylation, but they typically can just keep going basically. And so what this found was that, okay, people always thought that like mutations, the way that things change, That's not really the case. These move and can interfere quite, quite better than mutations can. They can interrupt promoters, enhancers, kind of dose genes. Like we saw with some of us that had ALU and those of us that didn't, some of us were heterozygotes, they're quite variable. They're much more common than a, than a mutation. So, because before this is what we were working with, a nematode, that was our first sequence genome. Not super, not super advanced. We were doing, we're doing okay on it. But the thing with the nematode is it's a pretty simple organism. Most genes literally, they literally just do like one function in a lot of cases here. It's the same sort of thing with bacteria. Typically they will just have one gene for, per trait. But what we also found were strange things like this and we'll see this next week non-coding RNAs, but they could form massive 3D structures of RNA. And we would find these genes coding and making RNA all the time, making loops, making spin arounds, things like that. And they had some sort of role. Strangely, humans have a lot of these 3D RNAs and bonobos and chimps do not. And most of the areas that these express are in the brain. So this troubled people. So it wasn't microRNA. We kind of knew what that was already. These were genes that didn't have to become proteins to act on something. Specifically, the fact that they were in the brain caused a lot more thought. We'll see this next week. But this was the other thing. We were mad. Think of all the little islands in the Pacific. That's like kind of how a gene looks with its chromosomes. The rest is non-coding. You do have to jump far, far distances. If you guys ever go on the NCBI public website and see how much scrolling you will have to do, it's substantial. Even if you're going thousands at a time, you may not run into a new gene for ages, it seems like. Two last things that we found. We should be good. So let's do the bottom one first. We found genes that would express as receptors. Cool. They had a nice hydrophobic region. They have a nice active site working and they were actually expressed all over. A lot of these are expressed in us. But in all our searching, we have no gene that binds to that. It's 
That's why we call them an orphan receptor. They are in our cells, they're active, they're made into protein, but they don't have a signal. They don't have a partner. They just sit there forever. So to this day, it's one of the big mysteries is what orphan receptors do. In strange scenarios, they will sort of arise and start to like express a lot more, certain diseases, certain conditions, but not always. I also found one more thing called pseudogenes. Pseudogenes are the fossils I was talking about. They're genes that have no promoter left and no activator, nothing. But you can tell from the sequence that they're in triplicate and they do code for something similar to what you would expect in a gene. But they're sadly just buried and kind of lost to time and mutation because they lost their use at some point. So again, once we had the human genome, we also had the chimpanzee and bonobo one. And we would also again find that in that 5 million years since the split from whatever that last common ancestor that we were one 5 million years ago, humans lost quite a bit of things to this. Bonobos and chimps didn't. Again, sort of the rapid changes that we see in Homo sapiens, somewhere in there, the mis this mystery is like kind of waiting. So we'll take another break here in a sec. But most genes need partner genes to act. And the mystery was that we found all these genes and a lot of them just didn't have a role. To this day, we're still finding more roles sometimes for them. But it's really hard to find genes in certain cells that activate other cells with their partner gene, for example, and actually do something. So it's only very rarely that we'll be like, oh my God, like one of these orphan genes or one of these pseudo genes has like emerged or something and is doing something. It's not consistent enough to really call it. I don't know, genetics yet. But there are fossils basically of what we were that still exist in that genome. Okay, so go ahead and take one more break, then we'll see sequencing, the big one. All right, so other thing that the genome sequencing revealed was that, like I've kind of said throughout my time up here, the code itself was less valuable than we thought. We also found that we have a lot more proteins running around than we did genes. How is that possible? We've seen this, right? Those of you in the review, we kind of went over this last night. 
If you spit out exons and introns from 20,000 genes, how can you make that 100,000 different variations of that, right? What's the role of an intron? You can kind of think to yourself. Just make sure you're good with this concept because it's very easy to assess on the test. It comes down to that as valuable as DNA was, the RNA and how it's spliced is going to be offer a lot of variability even within a single organism. Remember, exons are the part that become protein. Introns are those little spacers. They can have plenty of roles. That's the main one. It means that you can selectively clip pieces out of genes to make them sort of, sort of different versions. This one isn't as blatant as the one I'll use. Typically what I do is I say, you skipped exon three, right? This one's a little more subtle. Because you can't include like even just tiny additions of exons versus whole ones sometimes. But for me and what I need, just remember that you can pick and choose which exon makes a protein. The body can do that too. Let's say that, for example, exon three is sort of like, forms like a stopping site for this protein. And that over here, this protein is able to stop itself, its activity pretty nicely because three is sort of a breaks, sort of like a break, a stop signal. But if you make it over here in this cell, it never stops, let's say. It's a very easy way to change activity. And that story can only be told in the RNA, right? So if you have any isoform questions show up, or if you have any mRNA questions show up, DNA sequencing isn't going to tell you enough, right? It's just going to say it's there, not how it's used. We do have a very good tool to say how it's used though, how RNA can be used. So this is something called RNA-seq. Basic concept is that we are not going to be able in this case, we don't care about the DNA. We wanna see how many RNA copies are out there. How high is the gene up? How much, how much quantity is being made? This is our way of measuring dosage. Obviously, if something's silenced, it'll be zero too. So this is also an on and off measurement. So. In a cell, we've got all these nasty little RNAs running around. What we do is that we blow the cell up. We're going to get all these RNAs. Let's zoom in on one of them. So looking at this big RNA, uh, it's very unstable. Remember how I told you this? Two OH groups, like very transient life. RNA as a signal molecule is meant to be very unstable because you don't want that signal having a long half-life, basically. You want it to make the gene and just be done. But in a very swift motion, what we can do is take these piles of RNA and introduce them to something from HIV. Again, reverse transcriptase. Remember how HIV goes from RNA to DNA, right? We just take that protein and harvest it a million times. And we're going to use it here in research. So what reverse transcriptase is going to do, remember? It's going to take what was RNA, and it is going to transcribe it into DNA. I'm leaving a little red in here. The RNA is physically gone, but I just want you to know like it came from the RNA. So all we're doing here is we're copying the info from, what, from the RNA. We're just turning it into DNA, right? That's it. DNA is nice and stable, right? It's not going to blow up. It's not going to bind to anything. Really nice. If I had a tube of DNA just sitting on the table here, it would last for like 10 years. It would just sit there probably. So what you do with all this DNA now that you have is that you can sequence and say, OK, how many copies of this region of DNA that you made from this gene do you have? In this case, we have one, two, and three copies over here, right? And you start to like stack that, and obviously it gets more complicated than that for the genes. But you can start to count how many times this was made, how many times did it show up? <laughs> yeah, this molecular image is a little mean. Maybe there's something more friendly that I can do. <laughs> Let's just say basically, yeah, once you can convert pieces of RNA into DNA, 
you can say how much, how many pieces showed up. Gene one, gene two, gene three. So once you're done with this and converted everything to DNA, basically you get these big stacks or small stacks or nothing for gene three. So by converting the RNA that was present in the cell at that moment into DNA, you make it long-term, then you just sequence how many times that DNA showed up. So that one had five copies, this one only made two, this one made zero. So how you can use this to attack the exam problems. If I give you something that it's like, I just want to know how high this gene is expressed, any sort of expression level, DNA sequencing can't tell you anything about that. You have to turn to RNA-seq, okay? If I need to know the RNA levels or I need to know the gene's expression after a certain drug, that's what I need. Sequencing, Sanger or otherwise, is not going to do anything for us. So what this nasty little image is showing is number of reads. And across a chromosome, it's showing areas that are active. So again, I'm not going to give you sequence reads to do, or I'm not going to give you kind of a nasty molecular image like this, but I do want you to be able to utilize this tool and know that this is the way that you can find gene expression. You cannot sequence your way to gene expression. The same copy of the same gene over and over. This one is expressed like in the middle. This one has a ton. This gene has like very little, because if you sequence things, you'd just be like, oh, gene, 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 right? It's not going to tell you enough, depending on your goal. All right, next fun character, chip seek. All right, let's see what this does. We'll go step by step. This is a fun one. So, nucleosomes, remember those are histones. What we can do is take a cell, kind of freeze it in time with formaldehyde. You don't have to know that detail. Mainly, I'm gonna, I want you to know the goal of this and what you can accomplish with this. So if you freeze the cell in time, you freeze what the histones are grabbing onto, what genes are silenced, right? Because if they're tightly wound by histones, it means they're off, right? What you do is then fragment everything. You digest the DNA. So all this like errant DNA that was actually open for business, you're actually getting rid of. ChIP-seq is a very good way to see what genes are silenced in this case. So the unbound DNA is digested and we wash it away. And then we take what we learned last week. Remember antibodies, how we can make them just about against anything, right? All you gotta do is expose a rabbit to one of the histone pieces and the rabbit will make our immune response for us. They're, they're pretty special rabbits. You can't just go outside and grab one. But if you make a protein antibody that will only bind to that histone piece, you've got specificity, right? So you grab them with the antibodies. And what you do is use that as sort of a filter. By grabbing the histone with the antibodies, then you release the DNA that they were grabbing onto. This was DNA that was always silenced, right? This was always what was grabbed by the histones. Basically, all the stuff at the bottom is you just sequence that DNA, and that's it. So, ChIP-seq, if you want to know regions that are silenced, that's the role. Regions that are bound by a protein. Regions of DNA that are interacting with protein. And the key with this procedure is the fact that we can generate antibodies against it's just about anything, really. Some of them are better than others, as I know from, from research, but they get the job done. This is a way to basically decide which pieces of DNA you want to find or silenced. Equally, you don't have to just do it on histones. So same procedure, even though it's red text. But in this case, we just make the antibody target a transcription factor. Remember a TF? This is how we find out what TF 
activates what gene? You can answer. that question. So again, I don't need you to know about cross-linking and stuff like that. Basically, all that is saying is that we lock transcription factors that are in place and then basically pluck the DNA that was bound, get our antibody, and then flush that away. And all you are left with is DNA but only DNA that was taken up by that target transcription factor. Trust me, as somebody who's done this too, transcription factors are very tough. Uh, they're very tough customers, unfortunately. This is something that uh, cost me a lot of time as a person in my 20s. Do not recommend. We did figure it out though, so hooray for us, but... Ugh. All right, so those are the tools to find out what if DNA is bound to a protein, how to find that piece of DNA. It's going to have an antibody step. All right, last one. We talked about methylation, right? Silences DNA that it's methylated. Easy enough. Introduce you to something super quick called bisulfite sequencing. That's how you measure methylation. Cytosines, the Cs, they're the one that get methylated in the DNA to silence stuff. It's just the nature of their chemistry. Bisulfite is a somewhat unhealthy and dangerous chemical conversion that you do in lab. That it will take any C that is not methylated and turn it into a uracil, which will consequently then be remade into a T by the repair mechanisms. So what bisulfite can do is that you combine the normal genome with your little altered genome and any cytosine, any C that remains a C in your new converted genome, it was methylated was silenced. So this is how you can find areas that were methylated. Let's get rid of that. So these two right here, since they had that methyl group, they ignored the bisulfite sequence and the chemical conversion, and they still remain Cs. This is the way that we can figure out regions that are methylated and thus likely silenced. So one of the practices that I gave you was, there's the gene, there's the promoter, there's the operator sequence, and here's an enhancer. Bisulfite can factor into some of the things where I'm like, if you want to know where a gene is silenced and methylated, it's almost too big of a giveaway you would use this one. So the way that I test this is like, all right, if this is methylated, and this is methylated, the promoter and the enhancer. Is the gene turning on very much? Not too much. So bisulfite for me is more of a context one and a choice that you can have among those answers. So when you're done today, kind of consider making like sort of a table of all these characters and how they can use them and like what their strengths are, what you can find with them. You don't need to tell me how this works right here. It'll help if you understand it, if you want, but it's not what I need. Okay, last one I actually promised this time. This is the way we do it now. It took a long time and a lot of engineering and a lot of greedy people to make, to make a lot of money to make this happen, <laughs> but it happened. This is why this, this tech is how we can do a sequence of like 23andMe can sequence all your exons for $150. So let's take a little look here. It's hard to explain statically. So if you go into the key info and click that link, you will see how cool and like magical this is. All right, what you do is you take DNA and you sort of shotgun it, kind of like before, right? You fragment it into little pieces. What you have waiting are these little libraries, these little things in teal right here. They are little four nucleotide sequences. So four nucleotides times four possibilities for each one, right? Like that's a good set of combinations, right? Was that 64? What is that? Yeah, maybe. So you have those little libraries. Now, eventually they will bind to all the DNA that matches their little set. 
Because remember, you're eventually going to run into a matching four, right, in that big shear of DNA. So what these do is to sort of hook on to the real DNA. And the reason they're called adapters is this next step. You split the DNA up again, and the adapters that you've attached, they attach to a very special and very expensive little chip, like a microchip. And all these little dots that you're seeing on this microchip, those are DNA attached to an adapter, which is attached to the chip. That's why you call it an adapter. DNA adapter to chip. So what happens is that what you're looking at here, and I can't really draw 3D as nice as I want to, is you are looking at DNA that is sort of like on this chip, like kind of sticking up like this now, each attached by one of those little adapters. What happens next is pretty neat, is that these are all single-strand DNA. On the chip, you feed in colored nucleotides, and they don't stop the sequence. and each one is colored specifically. So as you feed these colored nucleotides in, they will find that long stalk up here and start to bind to it. Like I said, watching the video on this one will help, I promise. And then as you go up each level, you get a new set of colors each time. That's what's showing here in cycle one, cycle two, cycle three. What was base one? What was base two? What was base three? And it's doing this simultaneously on this chip of millions and millions of DNA pieces. So what this does and what this turns into and why the video is great is it turns into this like magical, like red, white, yellow thing as it builds up. The computer will take images at each point. Those images will be turned into strands of DNA. Those strands of DNA will again be stitched together by the computer for like amounts. Because what you eventually get are these massive, overlays of DNA that match. And you can eventually, by combining all these regions that are the same, make sort of a, oops, I want that, make a massive master sequence, right? Based on the info that you gain from the computer and how it can stitch overlapping regions together. So when you hear sequencing, that's what we do now. That's the big one. What we do now to save money is typically we only sequence the exons, so just the coding region. But if you want to spend big money, you can sequence the whole thing, see the differences. So in terms of the problems that you'll see on the exam, if I want to know a specific spot, if that spot is mutated in this gene just here, Sanger's a great option. It's cheap, it's effective, it's not going to get messy. If you need to know the changes that, say you treat a tumor with a drug, what mutated in response? You don't know what mutated, right? You got to turn to something big like this, right? You got to know everything that changed. You can't Sanger the whole genome. This, you can tell everything. Now, it's called NGS, which is uh, next-gen sequencing, too. I think I, I think I mentioned that. So if you just need a spot, Sanger's your thing. It's accurate, it's cheap, and it's quick. This is expensive, hardcore, and ex it's expensive again. Let's just do that. So luckily, this is all green text coming up here. How do we stitch these all together? I'll just kind of scroll through these. Hooray. Yeah, you got to amplify them. You got to capture. You got to enrich. You got to say like, oh, here are the genes that are all overlapping on each other. Pipelines. Hooray. You can actually find. This is all green text. But if you're in bioinformatics, get ready to suffer. Um, I'm kidding. I hope. In this case, you can also find regions that were like not very enriched. You can actually find deletions. See right here, it's like, oh, you actually didn't get as many reads of chromosome seven. It looks like they're missing that one. And you can find all sorts of info. And informatics has given us the tools to kind of harness this and see what's going on in specific cells at different times and how they behave. The genome itself is just the beginning. You can get all kinds of fun processing and data. But it does take a few steps and a few experts, and it can, this stage can be the hardest stage sometimes, unfortunately. But right here, here's our reference today, human genome 19. That's the more accurate one. There's a human genome 38 out there, but um, you can use either or. Most papers still cite 19. 
Sweet, tons of stuff, hooray. This poor guy got included in this picture. But it's very easy for us to sequence and compare now. Healthy tissue versus tumor tissue. Diseased brain versus normal brain, right? We can see a lot of stuff now. But how to use that information and act on it is a whole nother thing. Last little character before hopefully a fun activity. Yeah, what's the commercial of future sequencing? Uh, Gary, dun, dun, dun. everybody's like, they're going to get my privacy. And it's like, well, they can get it from just about anything. All right, last couple of things. Last frontier is the one that we have not yet conquered, and that's proteomics technically. We can sequence RNA, we can do DNA, but there's a lot of proteins out there. I told you how there's about 20,000 genes. Maybe this person's saying 200,000 RNAs. There's over a million styles of proteins you can make because you can modify the protein after it's popped out too. So the hard part with where we're at with proteins, even though they're the ones that do stuff, is that we technically have to rely on giant bioinformatic networks of experiments and interactions. Basically, there are computers, sites that can tell you that with a lot of confidence, we know this protein interacts with this one, but it blocks this one, for example. It's kind of where we're at, is stitching together individual experiments. Because we only have one, there's, there's, there are expensive, like good chemistry tools to use, but there's one that's cheap and everybody loves. If you need to know where a protein is, you just use a Western blot. This is a good little summary of how that works. It's an antibody again. What you do is you mash up a cell, you harvest a bunch of protein, and you will buy an antibody that has been engineered to go after that protein. They bind up, all the other proteins wash away. So you don't want the others, you just want this one. That happens to bind perfect there. Then what you do is you find something called a secondary antibody, which you can also buy. This antibody is just going to bind kind of the like butt of the last antibody. The secondary one's important and it's more expensive because it comes linked with a fluorophore, some sort of detection signal, some sort of color, something. And that's how we can see how much protein is around. It's quite limited as far as like mass information, right? It's a little different than the others. But in all of your needs for any of the exam questions, and if, if I highlight the fact that I was like, okay, yeah, you mutated this thing, you, or you put a plasmid in or something, but you need to know if that protein made it in, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it. You can sequence, you can say, hey, the plasmid integrated, but you need to know if it actually worked. This is the way to do that. Hmm, sweet, okay. So that's how we... What? No, what? No, it's a happy time. Okay, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> happy Easter, everybody. Hooray. There's, these are going to pop open. Don't, uh, don't let it hit you. Sorry. <laughs> Be ready to catch them. If I strike you with an Easter egg, I bear no complaints. Yay. All right. Men in the middle, too. Did I, did I hit anybody with the egg yet? I hope not, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, open them up and you'll see what they're, what's in there. Partner up if you don't get one. Oh, I never gave you guys an A. <laughs> Did you guys not get any? No. Oh no, go get them. Share the eggs, one per three people. I ran out of eggs. Yeah, they're practice problems, don't worry. All right, who wants some more that are not eggs? Got some? Okay. There you go. So, yeah, you're supposed to have two in an egg. Yeah. Open another one. Yeah. So, work together and turn in your problems to me. You guys need any? <laughs> no. Sorry. It didn't hit anybody, did it? We can have another one. You guys good? Hooray. All right. 
Oh no, you got the line of sixteen. <laughs> Sorry, that's me. Give you have one. You guys have a couple. Yeah. There's a huge one. There you go. <laughs> All right. Who else got the bad egg? Yeah, there's a bad egg out there. Watch out. Minus 15 points. Yeah, be careful. Just kidding. All right. How's it going? Done with one? Give me it. And like, let's go over it a little bit. And then I'll give it to somebody else. All right, so when you're done, go ahead and like trade them and put your names on them and stuff. I don't know. Well, actually, don't put your name. I don't wanna, well, I kind of want to see if you've like gotten a bunch of them. So that's good, I guess. I, I kind of went in without a plan on this one. I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> just start exchanging practice questions after you finish them with people and like put your name on it that you're like, I rocked this or something. I don't know. I'm not going to track like who's here or anything. So yeah, trade when you are done with one, yeah.
All right, when well, you're finished with some of them, exchange with your neighbors, trade, economy. Who else got the minus 15 one? Nobody's, oh, you did? Oh, well, yeah, I know.
Yeah, you guys can keep your questions if you want. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'll collect the eggs right now. That's all. Thanks, Galen.